Hello, my name is Mike Batt, and I'm really pleased to have been asked to talk to you guys from the Lewis Carroll Society of North America. Uh, rather honoured, actually, I should say, because um, I myself have done a project called The Hunting of the Snark, um, and it's uh, a musical version. Uh, it was started out as a concept album and it then became a concert and after that I expanded it and it became a show which ran on the West End of London uh, in 1991. Before I go on I perhaps ought to tell you a little bit about myself. I started um, when I was 18 in the late 60s and um, making records and uh, being involved in the creation of projects. I had quite a lot of hits with uh, something called The Wombles. It all came from a TV show which I had written the song for. It led to eight top 40 hits in the UK. Further hit singles followed. Remember You're a Womble, Banana Rock, Wombling Merry Christmas, I was lucky enough to then go on and have quite a few hits with other artists in the UK. And ever since then I've been in the music business and having a fun time. In 1980 I went away with my family uh, on a yacht which I bought, uh, uh, an old yacht. We went off to, well, Australia. We went round the world in this big boat. I didn't really know where I wanted to go to when we set out. And I didn't really know where, well, I knew I was gonna come back to England, but I didn't know anything else. I got back to England. And it was only then that I discovered the hunting of the snark. And I literally tripped over a book of it in a, a bookshop in Charing Cross Road in London. Anyway, I took it home and I read it and became in, completely absorbed with it. And I decided that I would make it my next project. I decided, after telling all my friends for months that I was going to do it, that I really ought to get down to do it. So one day I sat down and picked up the phone and booked the London Symphony Orchestra for eight sessions, three months after that moment. That gave me a three month deadline to create the entire thing, which is what I enjoy, I thrive on a deadline. So having set these eight sessions, uh, I um, set to work with the usual panic that goes with a deadline, uh, but also it was the fun of the Lewis Carroll project that uh, motivated me. What um, intrigued me about the whole thing, about Lewis Carroll generally actually, but certainly about this specific thing, was the way it is interpretable in many, many different ways. Anyone who comes to it and does a version of it or an interpretation of it is going to bring a different complexion completely. Carroll himself said, as to the meaning of the snark, I'm very much afraid I didn't mean anything but nonsense. Though sometimes he would indulge questioners by seeming to agree with a lady who saw it as, quote, an allegory for the pursuit of happiness. I think I was probably carrying that with me when I wrote this piece. When I say wrote this piece, again, I want to be clear that I was not write, rewriting Lewis Carroll's verse. I was leaving that as sacrosanct. The only thing that I stole from Lewis Carroll were the words friends, Romans and countrymen. Friends, Romans and countrymen. Which of course he stole from Shakespeare anyway, so I felt I was on safe ground there. I got uh, my actors, my two wonderful actors, John Gilgood and John Hurt, to speak in the same meter as the rhythm of the music, which was a slight what do you call it, restriction for them, because they're used to being able to speed up and slow down uh, to add um, an extra dimension to it as actors. But they both fell into that discipline very nicely. 
Just the place for a snark, the bellman cried, as he landed his crew with care, supporting each man on the top of the tide by a finger entwined in his hair. They sought it with thimbles, they sought it with care, they pursued it with forks and hope, they threatened its life with a railway share, they charmed it with smiles and soap. Of course, before I started, I did get to know the characters. I should tell you that, of course, all the characters' names begin with B for a reason that we are not told. OK, so it's a mysterious tale of mysterious odd characters who go off together. Why do they go off? Looking for the snark. In each case, what is the snark? Because everyone says to me, what is the snark? They did back then. And I say, it's what you want it to be. So the banker presumably thinks of it as one thing, maybe money, billiard marker. I see him as a chancer. Maybe he sees it as uh, a gamble, the whole thing. Lovers and games, snookers the same, so join the queue. Get a good grip, don't let it slip, and think about the ring. Don't let a red go to your head. Now the songs, of course, have got lyrics, but the lyrics are not drawn from the Lewis Carroll. Uh, for example, the barrister sings a song called The Pig Must Die. Let's teach you a lesson we'll never forget For a devious deed it will live to regret It's clear that the pig must die We're of the opinion the pig must pay We can't let it live for another day It's clear that the rules are fine It's clear that the pig must die Very much I've stuck to the characters as he describes them and I just give them songs to sing. The strong reply, I beg you, my learned friends. For it seems to me with the naked eye that the pig can live or the pig can die. And its happiness all depends on the mercy that now extends for my learned friends. Part of my background is that I'm an orchestrator and conductor and composer. And so apart from writing pop songs, I wanted to add that orchestral element in. And so the thing was finished within three months and uh, very happily was able to recruit the services of quite a lot of very famous people. The song that I sang, which was the opening song, Children of the Sky, was graced by a solo from George Harrison, no less, and he invited me to his house to record it in the studio. When we did the Albert Hall concert, Midjua stood in and did the guitar solo, and um, a blistering job he made of it too. Art Garfunkel, who came and sang the role of the butcher. I came as the butcher on this escapade Without the heart for moving in for the kill It makes me want to be ill It's just one song, actually in his case, one and a half songs. Uh, one song and one duet. The duet is with Denise Williams. Denise is playing the beaver. Cliff Richard, Roger Daltrey. Julian Lennon played the part of the baker both on the record and at the Albert Hall concert. I came with the baker on this escapade. I need the dough, but I can't look after the bread. The banker does it instead. Uh, a chap called Captain Sensible, who was a punk in a band called The Damned. So he came and played the billiard marker. The record never really came out in this country on a major label. 
It's one of those kind of culty albums that I get lots of mail about. Meanwhile, however, we carried on with the production of a concert for charity at the Royal Albert Hall. It was only the 40 minute album length version. Uh, I hadn't by that time written it out into the full two hour musical, stage musical. Billy Connolly took the place of Cliff Richard who had played as the bellman on the record. Such a wonderful performer. Artie Garfunkel couldn't make it for the Royal Albert Hall production, so he was replaced by Justin Hayward, the lead singer of the Moody Blues, who was a very good friend of mine and has remained so ever since. As long as the moon can keep on shining And the years keep rolling slowly by You'll be a friend of mine As long as It was just fun, and as we filmed that, uh, we were able to put the film out on Channel 4, and it received uh, very, very good notices. Uh, I should explain that it took me a few years to get the opportunity to put it on in the West End, and again, it was one of the things I'm the most proud of in my life. We were all very happy with it. So it was quite an ambitious visual production, which I had designed specifically around this particular passion I had for animation and design using still photography. It was more like a magic lantern show, as the old Victorians used to call it. So it was quite an adventurous production, which of course is in keeping with the adventurous nature of the poem. Just after I'd recorded this piece to camera for you uh, yesterday, I realised that I'd left out the, the most important details about, that you might like to know. And I'm going to go straight to the piece of theatre, really, because that's where it ended up. Horror of horrors. I invented another character. Uh, I made sure his name began with B, and he's the bishop. And the reason I invented the bishop is that I wanted to be able to project into my version of the snark the fact that of course religion is one of the things that is caused by belief uh, and um, why not have a religious character in there I put a little touch in there where he's actually got a little pink teddy bear that he clutches all the time uh, while he's telling everyone else uh, that the snark is actually you know the great god that we're all looking for but his comfort is really coming from his teddy bear so make of that what you will. So, we have my main four characters, which are the same main four characters as really Lewis Carroll had, but I'm just sort of bringing them into the fore, forefront to focus the concentration of the audience onto what I see as the main meaning of the snark, if there is one beyond what Carroll claimed, which of course, he claimed simplicity, but delivered complexity. And that is the rather wonderful paradox of Lewis Carroll. Anyway, my simplicity was that you have this very, very strong character called the Bellman. And he thinks the snark is just a beast. You just want to catch it. He doesn't think, he knows it's just a beast. This emotional occasion brings the moisture to my eyes And I rise to remark I think we may be gaining on the snark I've a notion of persuasion that I hear as distant cry And they're never very far away No, oh, they're never very far away So I rise to remark I think we may be gaining on the snark But the baker he says, ah, but my uncle told me is that if you find a boojum snark instead of a regular snark, you will softly and suddenly vanish away. And that makes it a bit of a dangerous undertaking. So let's think about that before we go too far. You might vanish away.
In the end, the bellman is so disgusted with the uh, baker that he grabs his bread roll, his French breadstick, and snaps it across his knee, and as if he's, you know, demoting him out out of the Foreign Legion or something. And the baker is so uh, upset about this that he he's propelled into action by the derision of the bellman. He goes off looking for the snark, just to show the bellman that he's not a, a coward. And sure enough, he finds one. And guess what kind of snark it is? It's a boojum. And of course, he vanishes away. The baker is shouting, the bellman said. He is shouting like mad, only hark. He is waving his hands, he is wagging his head. He has certainly found a snark. In my show, it's the bellman whose whole philosophy is if you're walking through the jungle, you walk boldly and you get there and all the snakes sort of tend to run away because you're so sure that you're going to get there. Whereas the, the baker would be creeping through the jungle worried about the snakes and giving off all this sweat and uh, scent of fear and they would, uh, they'd all be upon him in a moment. And so that is really the philosophy of it. And I've found out that in my own life, this is where I start thinking about it, how it affects me. I see that there's a lot of bellmen in me. I booked a 75 piece orchestra uh, 12 weeks ahead without anything having been written. And that was me being the bellman. I decided that I was going to be a piece called The Hunting of the Snark. Um, and therefore there would be. There have been times in my life, um, many times, when I've thought to myself, oh, I'm not sure I really want to go into this thing because um, what if that happens or what if this happens? And then in those moments, I'm a baker. And I think in all of us, there's a baker and a bellman constantly fighting. And really that is the essence of what this musical is about. Are you healthily unaware of danger? so you carry on, or are you unhealthily too aware of danger so that you don't carry on? And those are my arguments presented by those two characters. Ask him, you dear uncle, the bellman exclaimed as he angrily tingled his bell. The other two characters are the beaver and the butcher. The butcher wants to kill the beaver. He can only kill beavers. Eventually, in the valley, as you know, if you've read the poem, the butcher and the beaver have a common enemy. All of the danger around them, the jub-jub bird, all of the different things that could hurt them. And it's that that makes them cling together and become friends, which is, of course, what happens in life. The minute we have a common enemy, we all group together and forget our differences. And that's what happens with the beaver and the butcher. In my case, I've... In order, of course, uh, not cynically, but kind of artistically, with a bit of license, I've made her a girl beaver, um, and he, even though he's a human being, he's a, he's a guy, so it's kind of okay. In the Lewis Carroll world of uh, nonsense, they end up sort of as an item, and uh, they sing a song about that, which gives us a nice bit of love interest for the show, but is not contrary to what Lewis Carroll said, because all I've done is make it romantic love rather than just two enemies becoming friends, which is, of course, what Lewis Carroll was pointing out. A common enemy has brought them together, and that's really the point he's making. Oh, it's hard to believe we could end up friends by a delicate combination of fear of the dark, belief in the star. I've said that I went away on a boat and came back just before I wrote this. And one might think that I had boats and trips and around the world on my mind. Well, I didn't really. I'd put that behind me. I was moving on. I was trying to get back into my stride uh, as a songwriter, composer, conductor, whatever. 
And I had no thoughts about the fact that I'd been on a boat trip. So when I picked up this book, The Hunting of the Snark, I didn't for one minute think, ah, oh, here's a book about uh, a, a maritime journey that is similar to one that I undertook myself. I say similar because when I went away on my boat around the world, I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I was looking for. I still don't know whether I found it. Looking back on it, and only after I completely finished it, and some years later, did I realise that I myself was painting my own life by doing a rendition of The Hunting of the Snark. There was this mysterious, rather madcap crew, and I have been uh, accused of being slightly madcap occasionally. Uh, I'm not proud of it, but there you go, that's the way it is. Hey, you know, there I was writing my own life story in, in The Hunting of the Snark. The fact that I'm a bit of a bellman, I like to be the boss, I'm very confident. Um, I do things with often not much fear. And watch me, and we'll bring bring you in the right place. Here we go. And then sometimes I'm a baker, uh, which is somebody who's very much aware of the danger. And sometimes I find a boojum. I've gone through my life having success, and then having a bit of a boojum moment, uh, and not such a success. And maybe there's failures uh, where I'm a bit afraid of having failure. Perhaps it's the fear of the failure that brings the failure on, which is, of course, analogous to the fact that fear of the boojum brings on the boojum to the baker. And so, hey, you can philosophise yourself round in circles, but that's the thing about Lewis Carroll that I really love. And I just wanted to mention that, of course, having been on my own boat trip round the world, was something that just wasn't in my mind at all. I had no conscious feeling that this was what I was writing about, but only later did I realise that I had pretty much exactly written a story about myself and my family going round the world on a boat. Thank you so much for being there and listening to it and watching it. And I'm hoping to have got back from my holiday in time to be live to do a little bit of Q&A if you have time. Anyway, thanks so much for being patient and listening and watching.